In time, the priest presiding at the Eucharist was no longer viewed as the offerer of the prayers of the community, but another Christ making sacrifices for the sake of the people. The priest was no longer making offerings. <coughs> what they used to do in Egypt, what they used to do in Babylon, what they, what they used to do in every major civilization. Okay? He's no longer the priest anymore. At the altar, he is Christ. Christ comes through him. What do you call that? A little bit more than that. They fought over these words. I, I heard it from somebody. Yes. Well, we know it concerns the host. Okay? Transubstantiation? Is that what it is? <laughs> Not transfiguration, transubstantiation. Yeah. We know that. And people have massive arguments about this. But I mean, wouldn't you, if you're in a position of power, you now have a chance of a good life, okay? You really do have a chance of a good life. So, so he says, well, you know, once, you know, every day you're in front of the altar, Christ comes down through you and everything. Oh, well, Jesus, you're, you're not just, you're not just Joe, the baker's son. You're now the guy that Christ comes through every day when you're up at the altar. So you know, you're, you're very special. You're extremely special. <coughs> This development indeed illuminates the conditions of the time that makes apparent the church was on the road to institu institutionalization, characterized by a distinct hierarchy. Okay? And it appears that this situation was necessary for the continuance and the welfare of the community. Now I'll give this to a bunch of MBA students at MIT and say, come up with something similar to this. They would not come up with a church. In fact, I think they might do away with the hierarchy even. They might work in a different way. Because if you want welfare for the people, well, there's a different way of delivering whatever the people need. There's a different way of doing things. We have people that go off to Africa and China and Central America that decide to make wells for the people, teach them how to go out to you know, farm their own stuff and get their own water, etc. There are people that do that. So, what is involved here is we're looking at a very, very distinct move in power. It's a power shift. Christianity had become, in many striking ways, a mirror image of the empire itself. It was Catholic, universal, orderly, multiracial, and increasingly legalistic. The one thing that the emperor had and the senate had was the power over law. They had that power. Now the church has it. And not only do they have it, they have the agreement of the emperor that he must bow his head down. He must surrender his neck to the bishop of Rome. It was administered by a professional class of literates, wealthy landowners, urban bourgeoisie, who functioned like bureaucrats, and its bishops like imperial, um, uh, they're like imperial governors. So you have bishops living in certain cities, they're just identical to Pliny, who was a governor in northern Turkey. Now you have a bishop. It appeared to be a marriage of convenience between state and church. And of course, if any of you know your history, we've had massive problems between state and church and the separation that took place. In a letter from Constantine to the clergy in which the emperor commands that the rulers of the church be exempted from all political duties, it appears that the emperor attempted to diffuse the clergy and to get them on side in order to exercise some power over them. He also began to transfer other privileges to the Christian clergy, which implies a class status situation. Now would Christ come back on earth? And I always give you this, I always tell you this, I throw it back at you. 
Was Paul, who's preaching somewhere in Corinth and Ephesus, walking shoulder to shoulder with Christ, with Jesus? Jesus will say, I'm Jesus. Paul will say, I'm Christ. But they're walking nonetheless. Would they recognize this? Would they look at a bishop and say, what the hell is this? Would they look at his wealth, his power, his legal, legal standing? Would they recognize this? And if, if they do recognize it, what do you think their reaction will be? If you think turning those tables over was a major problem, and that got him crucified, by the way, turning the tables in the temple was a problem, well, there would be a bigger problem, I think, on our hands. I think it might just might be that exception in the Bible where, where a Christ and a Saint Paul may, just may, commit murder. By looking at this, they just might turn into an Elijah. It's like, oh, well, geez, what the hell are we dealing with here? 